Okay. Let's get started. What I want to do today, um, there are really two things I want to talk about. I want to talk about um, optimality and tolerance, uh, and I want to talk about speciation. Um, we'll begin by talking about uh, optimality and tolerance. Let's see if I can get this on the right screen. down to this. Why is it that organisms have the distributions that they do? Um, why is it that uh, why is it that you see some species like southern flying squirrels completely associated with hardwood deciduous forests um, and when you get into a coniferous forest they are replaced by northern flying squirrels. Or why is it that you see gray squirrels in certain kinds of habitats and fox squirrels in very different habitats? Why is it that yellow-bellied marmots are in the Rockies? And why is it that woodchucks, which is our marmot species, is not? Okay? What defines the limits to where those species can live? Okay? Uh, and in order to talk about that, we need to think about organisms in the context of something we refer to as a niche. Um, a niche is sort of difficult to describe or to define. The easiest way to think about a niche is simply as where an organism lives and what it does. Okay? There are all sorts of wonderful elegant mathematical descriptions of niches and things of that sort. But when you're thinking about it on just the day-to-day, -day, it's easiest to think about simply where an organism lives and what it does. Okay? So it's vague in some sense, but once you begin to understand it a little bit, it will make perfect sense. Okay? Uh, so let's think about the southern flying squirrels, which is Glaucomys volans. It's a species that lives in hardwood deciduous forests. Um, and you can see it everywhere from a sort of an interesting um, distribution. Uh, if here's a map of the United States, there's Florida. Oh, I made my map. I screwed up my map. Plus, I don't like this marker. Plus, there aren't any other markers around. So we're stuck. I don't know what that little bump there is. There's the Gulf, and there's Mexico. Okay? And if you look at where you find the southern flying squirrel, you find it basically throughout this whole region right here, all the way up to the Canadian border, all the way down into Florida, and all the way down in Honduras and Guatemala on mountaintops. You don't find it in the desert. The only place you find it is where you have hardwood deciduous forests. The other species of flying squirrel, the northern flying squirrel, has a distribution. I'll make a better map this time. There's the United States. There's Mexico, South America, Florida. There's the Rockies. There's the Sierras. 
like that. There are the Appalachians. And there's Canada up there. And there's Alaska. The northern flying squirrel is all across Alaska and Canada, comes down the Sierras, comes down the Rockies, comes down the Appalachians like that, does not get into Florida, does not get into Mexico. That's where it is. In fact, the northern fly squirrel is associated only with coniferous forests. The southern flying squirrel is associated with deciduous forests. What's the difference? What's different about conifers and part of deciduous trees? The amount of rain. Ah, I don't know about that. The leaves. Yeah, the leaves are different. Okay, so conifers have short needles and Hardwood deciduous trees, like oaks and hickories, will lose their leaves throughout the winter. Okay, that's one difference. What else is different? There's seeds. The seeds, okay. So, hardwood deciduous things like oaks and hickories and pecans have hard mass. They produce acorns or hickory nuts, and they drop those at the end of the season. And it's this food packet that you can then store and stash. Okay? So, what southern flying squirrels do is once all the acorns start falling, they start larder hoarding the acorns. So, they'll find a cavity somewhere, and they will just stash it full of acorns. Well, as you know, there are two types of oak trees, many more than just two, but the two basic types are black oaks, or red oaks, and white oaks. The difference between their acorns is important. Black oak acorns are filled with tannins, the same stuff that makes your red wine taste just a little bit bitter, the same stuff that gives your porter or your stout that nice kind of taste to it, all right? White oaks don't have those levels of tannins. The difference is that when a flying squirrel finds a white oak acorn, it eats it. When it finds a red oak acorn, it stashes it. You can do these little experiments, and it's amazing. They'll come across a white oak acorn, zap, eat it right then and there. Black oak acorn, red oak acorn, they stash it. I wonder why they do that. They don't just stash it. What they do is they'll go down to the little, what's that called, where the apical meristem is, that little, where the leaves are going to emerge. I just had botany. You know, where, where the seed is going to start to grow. They will take their little teeth and they'll bite that out, essentially killing the damn thing so that it can't do anything, and then they stash it. Now why would they do that? Why eat the white oaks and stash the red oaks? Well, tannins make it taste bitter, so the white oak ones are sweet, and the black oak red oak ones don't taste so great. They're also deep because they last longer. They last longer because the black oak acorns are resistant to insects. So when you store a black oak acorn, it's good all winter long. The white oak acorn, it's going to get annihilated by the insect pests. So they're preserved, they're saving the ones that they know are going to keep, and they'll eat the ones that they know are perishable. Okay? All right. So that's where the southern flying squirrels are throughout here. Notice the southern flying squirrels also live in the Appalachian Mountains. But if you've ever been in the Appalachians, you know that at the lower elevations, it's hardwood deciduous forest. And at higher elevations, it's coniferous forest. So the southern flying squirrels go up to the bottom of the conifers, and they don't go any farther. 
the northern flying squirrels are in the conifers, but don't come down into the hardwood deciduous forest. So what do northern flying squirrels eat? I mean, if you give them an acorn, they'll take it. They don't, they don't like it very much. I wonder what northern flying squirrels eat. Truffles. You guys know what truffles are? Not the chocolate-covered truffles that you're going to give your girlfriend for Valentine's. That's just candy. What's a real truffle? Yeah, it's this, it's this underground mushroom, right? It's this nitrogen-fixing thing, right? So it's a fungus. And what these northern flying squirrels do is they come down, and they're digging through the ground looking for truffles, and when they find one, they'll eat it. And they do that all year long. So they're not storing truffles. You can't store a truffle. But they're eating those damn things. They are what we refer to as keystone species. So when you go into an old growth forest and you find lots of flying squirrels, one of the reasons why it's an old growth forest is because the northern flying squirrels are dispersing the spores from the truffles. So they're eating the truffles, they poop out the spores from the truffle, and they create new, tr new truffles where they poop. And the reason the truffles are important is because the truffles are fixing the nitrogen, which is essential for these trees. If you remove the northern flying squirrels from the system, the forest system collapses. So that forest system is dependent on the presence of the northern flying squirrels. So we call the northern flying squirrels a keystone species. You guys know what a keystone is? Who knows what a key, who doesn't know what a keystone is? If you, look, if you look at an archway, like the archway to a door that's curved at the top, When they built the St. Louis Arch, the keystone was the last one they put in, right? So they're building these two things coming up like that in the middle, and then they insert the keystone between them, and that's the one that keeps the two things elevated and keeps everything from collapsing in on itself. If you look at Academic Hall, I think that you can see some keystones over there in various arches. In the Serena building and some of the older buildings on campus, you'll see examples of keystones. Okay? Some of the houses we walked past, for those of you that were doing Transact D, they had keystones. Okay? All right, so they're called a keystone species. Terrific. So why is it that these squirrels have the distributions that they do? Well, we know the southern flying squirrels are eating acorns, and we know that northern flying squirrels are eating truffles. Okay? How did those flying squirrels get down to Guatemala and Honduras? Because between there and the hardwood deciduous forest up here is a lot of desert. And the thing about deserts is flying squirrels don't do very well in deserts. They don't glide from cactus to cactus. They glide from tree to tree. So how do they get down there? They walk? I don't think so. How do they get down there? 
there used to be like a wider range of the forests before like a desert occurred? That's right. The habitats that you see on this planet now are temporary. It wasn't always the way it is now. At one time, part of the deciduous forest extended all the way down into Guatemala and Honduras. Okay? When would that have been? Why, when you're in Missouri, on the south side of the Missouri River, we have all these hills, the Ozarks? North of the Missouri River, it's flat. Why is that? Glaciers. Yeah, because of the last glacial events, right? The last glacier that came down came all the way down to the Missouri River, scoured everything out. So the glacier was up to that point. So that means we were right to the south of that glacier. Well, that glacier is nothing but this gigantic block of ice. So what would that do to the temperatures here? It would be cold. Okay? So what kind of trees would you have in places where it's cold and there's a lot of snow? Okay, so there you are. You're in, you're in Southern California, downtown Los Angeles. God damn, it's hot and there's nothing more that you want to do right now but go up into the ponderosa pine trees. Where would you go? Where are the ponderosa pines? Okay. So, you're standing at the base of the Sierra Mountains. Okay? You're standing right there at the base in the Central Valley of California. As far as the eye can see, nothing but artichokes. And you want to go up into the trees. You have to go up. So you start climbing the mountain. And the first thing you notice is that you're out of the artichokes, and now you're into some sagebrush. You go a little bit higher, and now you're in a Joshua tree woodland. So all sorts of Joshua trees everywhere. These sort of yucca looking things. You go a little bit higher, and now you're in the pinyon pines, these short little pine trees. You go a little bit higher still, and now you're in the ponderosa pine. You go a little bit higher still, and now you're in the spruce and the conifers. So as you go up in elevation, you're entering different kinds of trees. You're encountering different kinds of trees. At low elevations, it's pinyon pine. At high elevations, it's white spruce and hemlock. Why? Temperature. Temperature and moisture. Okay? Anybody ever been to Estes Park and oh, man, you get up above the tree line and holy smokes, there are no trees anywhere. Why not? There's plenty of ground. Not enough oxygen, not enough moisture, it gets too cold. A whole suite of things are coming into play. But you've exceeded the ability of that plant to live in that location. Okay? So at one time, when that glacial advance was all the way down here, hardwood deciduous forests extended all the way down into Guatemala. And as the glacier retreated, so as the earth warmed, and the glaciers went farther and farther and farther north, the weather and the climate down here changed. And as it warmed, the trees couldn't make it anymore. It's too hot, not enough water. So if you're out west and you want to be someplace where it's cooler, where there's more water, where do you go? Up. Up. As you go up in elevation, the temperatures get cooler, there's less evaporation, it's going, there's going to be more moisture. And that's exactly what happened to those hardwood deciduous trees. They went up. So now they're sitting there on the tops of these mountain peaks, and that's the only place you find them. Down below is all desert. So the flying squirrels that were there got trapped on these mountain tops with the hardwood deciduous forest. 
They've been trapped there for a long damn time. They can't cross the desert. That means they've been isolated from all the flying squirrels up here for a long, long time. And the thing is, we know all about the genetics of these guys. Nobody has been down there to do anything with the genetics of these guys down here. Nobody knows how similar they are genetically to the animals up here. That would be an awesome PhD dissertation. Figure out what's going on genetically with these animals. They've been isolated for eons of the animals up here. Okay. Are they still the same species, or are they now different? Okay. All right, so now here we are. Here are the Appalachian Mountains. And on the tops of the Appalachians, that's where the northern flying squirrels are. Why are the northern flying squirrels up there? That's where the truffles are. The truffles are not in the heart of the deciduous forest. The truffles are in the conifer forest. Okay? So what's happening now with climate change? The temperature is getting hotter, so therefore the deciduous seeds got to go up. Deciduous trees are moving higher and higher in elevation. The conifers are beginning to fade out and disappear. The northern flying squirrels, which used to come all the way down here into the southern, southern Appalachians, are now up here. The southern flying squirrels, which used to stop almost perfectly at the Canadian border, are now, in southern Canada, the dominant flying squirrel. The northern flying squirrels are retreating farther and farther and farther north. And that's just with these very small temperature differences that we've encountered with climate change. They simply aren't making it down here. All right. So what's going on? We think of these things in terms of tolerance limits. Okay. Every species has a certain set of requirements that it needs in order to persist. One of the things that's going to be important is temperature and moisture, things of that sort. And if you exceed those limits, the species is no longer there. You can think of it as as a bell-shaped curve. So if there's the middle, if that's where the average is for whatever you're looking at, whether it's moisture or temperature or whatever, there is a limit out there. And beyond that limit, the species can no longer exist. So it can go from there to there, but beyond that limit, it can no longer exist. So we refer to these things right here as the tolerance limits. It could be temperature. It could be moisture. It could be the availability of some food item. Usually, it's a combination of things. For northern flying squirrels, it's the presence of truffles. Once there are no truffles, there are no, flying, there are no northern flying squirrels. There are no truffles when there are no conifer trees. All right. All right, so uh, there is another, um, yeah, we've already talked about that. All right, let's talk about Miriam's life zones. Um, there was this guy named Seahart Merriam. Pardon me. Oh, damn. Uh, there was this guy named Seahart Merriam. Seahart uh, Merriam uh, was a vertebrate biologist at um, UC Berkeley way back in the day. Seahart um, Merriam Seahart Merriam um, is famous for a number of things. Uh, there are numerous awards 
that are named for C. Hart Merriam in various ornithological and mammal societies. Um, we refer to, um, th there are numerous species that are named after C. Hart Merriam. For example, the Merriam's kangaroo rat, Dipodomys merriami, which is the ultimate honor that you can get as a biologist is to have some species named after you. Um, an interesting, interesting, interesting fellow. And one of the things that C. Hart Merriam noticed in all of his field work back in the early part of the 20th century was that there are these things that he referred to as life zones. So if you're, he was obviously at Berkeley, so he was in the western United States. Um, as he traveled around, he noticed some interesting sorts of patterns. For example, in the coastal range of California, there's this vegetation type referred to as the chaparral. Uh, there used to be a television, a Western television program on um, back when I was a, a kid called the High Chaparral. And even as a kid, I knew it was bullshit because I knew enough about habitats and things of that sort to realize when they filmed this thing that was no damn chaparral that they were showing on this program. Even though the program was called the High Chaparral, they were always talking about, yeah, we're going to go up into the High Chaparral. They were always saying that. There was no chaparral in that program at all. Okay? Pissed me off. But at any rate, chaparral is this kind of interesting plant. It's this plant that grows over about 15 years. It grows from a seed to a mature plant. And at the age of 15, it becomes senescent. That is, it no longer reproduces. So it matures, grows for about 15 years, it gets about this tall, right, spreads out a little bit, and then you have six feet farther away, you have another chaparral plant, so you can walk through them. What's happened in Southern California is they've suppressed fires. So all these people with all their money buy these big houses up on hillsides in the chaparral. And because they don't want their multi-million dollar houses burning, they have fire departments which put out fires. And they have Smokey the Bear. Only you can prevent forest fires. In California, they say, only you can prevent range fires. So they actively suppress fire in Southern California and Northern California, too. And the consequence of that is that every time there's a little fire, the chaparral starts to burn. So they right away put it out. And the result is that the chaparral now is older than 15 years. It's all senescent now. It's no longer reproducing. There's, there are places in California where the chaparral is 60 years old or more. Holy shit. That chaparral is so brittle and so dry and so old and so thick because it keeps growing, it's just not reproducing anymore. It's so thick, you get into the chaparral and you're stuck. You can't go anywhere because it's that thick. It's bad news for the California condor. The California condor is this vulture with this massive wingspan. It's a huge ass bird. And this bird flies around looking for dead stuff. It'll find some dead fox or coyote or fido or pee, pee or cat or something laying in the chaparral. It lands, eats it, and then takes off. But because the chaparral is so thick now, the condor can't get into the chaparral, so it lands in the parking lot of the Walmart and walks in underneath looking for something to eat. Maybe it finds something? Probably it doesn't. But it gets lost and it's stuck underneath the chaparral and can't get out. And dies. So the population of condors in Southern California back 30 years ago, I think, was down to 12 birds. That's all that was left. They took those 12 birds into captivity Right to try and start a breeding program. I think they had six birds that they could work with. Six, okay? Yeah, there are six birds trying to reintroduce the California chaparral. Why? I have no idea. Because what are you going to do? Now you have 100 California condors, you're going to release them, and they're all going to die, 
walking in from the Walmart parking lot back underneath the chaparral. The problem is fire suppression. It turns out that chaparral, the seeds, in order for the seeds to germinate, they have to be scorched by flames. Fire is a natural part of the chaparral system. And on average, before we invented Smokey the Bear, the chaparral burned, on average, every 15 years. A fire would come through, it's all gone, and the next spring, all these new chaparral plants would come up and it would be renewed. But because we've suppressed the fire, that's no longer happening. And now it's so serious, now the chaparral is so thick, that if some mouse farts, there's enough heat energy to get this spontaneous combustion and the chaparral starts burning. And now it burns so hot and so fast, the seeds are not scorched, the seeds are totally consumed. So that now when the chaparral burns, nothing comes up behind it. So, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the Forest Service, Cal Fish and Game, all those people to make the poor people of Southern California feel better about nature, they go in and they replant, but they don't replant chaparral. They replant fescue. <laughs> they replant epic fescue. And the next spring it looks nice and green and everybody's happy and say, isn't nature wonderful? And they move back into their rebuilt multi-million dollar mansion with their boats and their campers and their RVs and all that good shit, and everybody's happy and the chaparral is gone. And that's the system to which we're trying to reintroduce California Congress. All right, so Seahart Merriam sees the chaparral, and he notices, oh, the chaparral is here associated with the coastal range. If I go out here into the Mojave Desert, I notice that there is creosote bush and rabbit brush. And if I go a little bit farther north, I run into sagebrush. And if I go up a little bit from the sagebrush, I run into Joshua Tree Woodlands. If I go up an elevation a little bit, or farther north, I come into the pinyon pine woodlands. And if I go up an elevation a little bit, or a little bit farther north, I run into ponderosa pine and jeffrey pine. And if I go a little bit farther north, or a little bit higher in elevation, I'm going to run into spruce trees and hemlock trees. So he noticed these things that he referred to as life songs. So the pinyon juniper woodland is always in this certain kind of bioclimatic zone defined by precipitation and temperature. Same thing with the ponderosa pine, same thing with the Mojave Desert, same thing with all these other species. In the Sonoran Desert, what's the indicator species for the Sonoran Desert? How do you know you are in the Sonoran Desert? seen western movies on TV and they're out in Arizona somewhere and you right away know whether they're filmed it in Los Angeles in Hollywood or whether they were actually in Arizona when they filmed it how do you know what cactus defines Arizona surely you, you, surely you know that nobody here has ever been to Arizona You guys need to spend your summers doing different sorts of stuff. Man, don't get a job. Screw that. <laughs> Live life, man. Jobs are for weenies. Don't do that. You need to travel a little bit. In Arizona, the, the species is the saguaro cactus. Okay, you know what that cactus looks like. That's a saguaro cactus. Okay, that is the indicator species for the Sonoran Desert. If you see that, 
you know a couple of things. Number one, you know you're in the Sonoran Desert. And number two, you know that it's not going to freeze at night. Because if it freezes at night, that thing is going to wilt and fall over and it's dead. So a, sonoro, a saguaro cactus that's 12 feet tall might be 150 years old. And it's never once frozen. Okay, It never got frost. The beauty of it is that in California, Southern California, police dipwads, they want to have environmentally friendly front lawns, so they don't want to water their lawn. And yet, they want something that's going to look nice. So these dipshits will drive out to Arizona, find a 12 foot tall saguaro cactus, dig it up, put it on the back of a trailer, drive it back to their front lawn in effing LA, and plant it. And it'll do great all summer long. And it turns out that even in Los Angeles, on some winter days, you get just a touch of frost. And when that happens, they come out the next morning, and that saguaro cactus is dead. And do you think they learned their lesson? Oh, hell no. That spring, they're going to drive the hell back out to the Sonoran Desert, dig up another one, and plant it again. In other words, tolerance limits for the saguaro cactus are defined to a large extent on the basis of temperature. The lower limit right, is freezing. If temperatures get too close to zero degrees centigrade, the saguaro cactus doesn't exist there. Temperature, low temperature defines that lower tolerance limit for the saguaro cactus. So, those life zones refer to, we, we talked about these biomes, those life zones actually do refer to specific kinds of biomes. A specific combination of temperature and moisture, which determines where those species can be. Think about humans. I think we've already talked about, for example, the Inuits, the Eskimos, right? How do Eskimos look different from you? Where do they come from? Asia. They come from Asia. Okay? So they have a lot of Asian features. Round faces, right? And they carry an awful lot of body fat. So they're not skinny minis like you guys. They're carrying a fair bit of fat. And that's a good thing because without that fat, they wouldn't make it. If they were skinny minis like you guys, they freeze to death. But because they have that extra fat, they're able to tolerate those extreme cold temperatures. You guys have an appreciation for how cold it gets in Alaska or up in the Arctic? Anybody here ever experienced minus 40 degrees centigrade? It, it, it hurts to breathe minus 40, okay? Um, in the Second World War, when the Germans were trying to take Stalingrad, it got down to minus 80 degrees centigrade. The primary cause of death was not frostbite, it wasn't freezing. What the German soldiers would do, the first thing they did is they never turned off any of their machinery. So all the tanks, all the trucks, all the jeeps, they left the engines running 24 hours a day because they knew if they ever turned it off, they would never get it started again because the oil would freeze, right? So they kept those things running. What the German soldiers would do is they would compete with each other for who gets to sleep by the exhaust pipe of the truck or the tank. Because you knew if you fell asleep right there underneath the exhaust pipe, you wouldn't wake up. It was a hell of a lot easier just dying out there in your sleep than it was ending up in the gulag or something like that. All right. Let's uh, look at a, one more example 
Um, I want to talk about the western collared lizard. Um, well, here we call it the eastern collared lizard, but it's all the same species, Crotophytus cholerus. Uh, do you, have you guys ever seen a collared lizard in Missouri? They're awesome. They're they have these. Colored. Yeah, they're really, especially when they're in reproductive mode, they have these nice rings that go around their necks. Okay, and when the females are grabbed, they have these beautiful orange and turquoise colors that develop on on the side of their abdomen. And the coolest thing about these guys is that they're just totally badass little lizards. They don't back down for anything. I mean, they are really aggressive. So if you go over and you try and pick one up, this guy is going to be sitting there going, yeah, come on, dude, I got you. Come on, bring it on, man. These guys are so in your face, they open their mouth, they are ready just to attack. They're up, they can't do anything, they're just these little, but they are really aggressive. They make their living eating baby birds, eating other lizards, eating little snakes, eating mice. So they're killers. They're out there just killing shit. They're awesome. Okay? So here are these guys in Missouri, and you're going, what the hell are they doing in Missouri? Because Crotophytus is a desert species. You find it in the Sonoran Desert, you find it in the Mojave Desert, you find it in the Chihuahua Desert. It's a desert damn species. What the hell is it doing in Missouri? It turns out that in Missouri, we have these habitats called glades. So it's just a little opening like that at which Rocks are really close to the surface. If you've ever been to Tomsock Mountain, right, there's a couple of glades up there. It's just a really rocky area. It'll be surrounded by oak trees and, and hickories and things of that sort. But out in the middle of this path is going to be this glade. And because the rock is exposed right there, when the rock gets hit by the sun, the rock heats up, gets nice and warm. Because of all the heat, all the vegetation around it gets all dried out. So in a very real way, it's like a little miniature desert in the middle of this hardwood deciduous forest. The rain comes down, hits the rock, washes off. There's almost no moisture in the soil there because it's on the top of this mountain. It's rocky. It's hot. Okay, It's like a little miniature desert. And that's where you find these collared lizards. So in Missouri, you have these glades in a number of places. I've forgotten how many glades there are in Missouri, somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 of them or something like that. There was this guy at Washington University named Alan Templeton, and he was a geneticist, population geneticist. He was sort of intrigued by that problem. He says, gee, I wonder how these guys got there, and I wonder how much gene flow there is between one glade and the next. In other words, is it possible for a lizard to go from here over to here, or from here to there, and vice versa? So this was back in the day when we didn't have the genetic te techniques that we have today. Okay? We didn't have CRISPR, we didn't have you know, PCR, we didn't have any of that sort of stuff. In fact, the, the key genetic technique that we were using back in those days, um, what was that called, where you would take pictures, of the, you would stain the chromosomes, and then take pictures of them, the karyotypes, right? We could do karyotyping and that was it. So we could look at the banding patterns on DNA, but that was the, on chromosomes, but that was the extent of it. So he wants to know how similar genetically are these guys to these guys. How would you do it if you had no modern technology, but you had good dissection skills, you had good veterinary medical skills, what would you do? Anybody here ever had a skin graft done? Nobody? Skin grafts are a hoot. When you get a skin graft, 
they're going to take skin from one part of your body and put it on another part of your body. So they harvest it from one part and put it on another part. Okay? And usually, if you have good circulation, it works. Because where you put the skin is genetically identical to where you took the skin from. You are genetically compatible with yourself. All right? So skin grafting from a person to the same person generally works. But if you were going to skip, like just on the news the other day, there's this wonderful example of this guy, um, the first person ever to get, at the same time, a double hand transplant and a full face transplant. So he got a face transplanted. From, he, was, he had been in a fire when he was younger, lost his nose, lost his ears, lost his eye, eyebrows, and his eyelids, and all of that sort of stuff. And had been living like that for a long time. And he got a transplant from somebody. So he got a face transplant. He had also lost his hands in this fire. And at the same time that he got the face transplant, he got the hand transplant. And so far, it's worked. Okay, so he, he looks fine. He's not good looking, but he looks better than he did. Okay, and he's got two functional hands. What's the problem? What's the biological problem that he's confronting? What does he have to do? What is his immune system doing? Probably trying to attack the foreign it's foreign tissue. The immune system is, get that shit the hell out of here. His immune system is attacking this foreign tissue. So that means for the rest of his life, he's going to be on drugs to inhibit the immune system from rejecting this foreign tissue. Which means, if he encounters the COVID virus, he's not going to make it because he's suppressing his immune system. Okay. So what you could do then with these lizards is you could get a lizard from here and a lizard from here, and you could graft skin from this lizard to that one and from this lizard to that one. You could also graft skin from a lizard in this population to a lizard in the same population. Yeah. I don't also see if they can like cave it. That's exactly right. You know, what, like, uh, you know, no means of, you know. Well, of course, you would probably be able to successfully mate with somebody from Africa. Yeah. You're the same species. Yeah. But you're genetically very different. I guess. I don't yeah, you are. I mean, physically. Well, the physical differences are a consequence of the genetic differences. Yeah. Okay? So what happens? When he, when he does a skin graft from the, an animal in this glade to an animal in that glade, the skin graft is always rejected. 100% of the time. From this glade to that glade, it's rejected. From this plane to that plane, it's rejected. So every time he did a skin graft between glades, the graft was rejected. However, every time he did a skin graft within a glade, glade it was accepted. So what does that tell you? Different species. No. The gene pool is, like, there is not much genetic variance. There's no genetic variance. All these guys in this glade are genetically identical. All these guys in that glade are genetically identical. All these guys in this glade are genetically identical. In other words, that would be like you're living in this little pot, you're living in this little, and I'm not saying you, if you live in this little town in Missouri, and everybody in the town is just like you. They all look like you, they all talk like you, they all act like you. They're genetically just exactly like you. That's what it's like in those ways.
That's bad news. Why? Yeah. Keep reading. Yeah, I mean, they are all totally inbred. Okay? Why is inbreeding bad? Lack of uh, gene flow, gene variants. Yeah. No genetic variants. Why is no genetic variants bad? If something happens to one of them, it happens to all of them. Yeah. If the environment changes, and it will, they no longer have any genetic variation with which to evolve. In other words, they are finished evolutionarily. That's it. That's the end of the line. That's all you get. When the system changes, they can't respond evolutionarily, and they go extinct. Okay? All right. Let's switch gears a little bit. Um, and what I want to do now is talk about um, some of the fundamentals of adaptation and evolution. Um, and it, as an example, I want to use population genetics. Uh, and this is going to be sort of a baby introduction. Uh, so I'm not going to ask you to do any of these computations or anything of that sort. All I want you to do is Think back to BI 063 when you were doing Hardy Weinberg equilibrium, and let's just review that and go over that just very gently. Okay, so we can understand what evolution is. Well, we already know that evolution is this process of adaptation. Okay? And that adaptation is dependent on the presence of genetic variation. Well, we know that, right, when we were talking uh, early on about um, how we respond evolutionarily. When natural selection works, it favors those organisms with the better forms of variation. If all the forms of variation are exactly the same, there is nothing for natural selection to favor. So either everything makes it or it doesn't. So the organism is presenting to nature a phenotype. That's what you are presenting to nature. You present this phenotype. You are this tall. Um, you have this color eye. You have this color skin. You have this kind of hair. Um, you weigh this much. You have feet that are this long or this narrow or whatever it happens to be. You have this many fingers and this many toes. You can hear sounds up to this. You can see things as far away as this. That represents your phenotype. Your phenotype is a consequence of a couple of things. One of the things that determines your phenotype is your genotype. So the actual alleles that you have. The other thing that determines your phenotype, however, is your environment. So, if you grew up in a household where, so when I was a kid, every Saturday morning I'd drive over to my buddy's house and uh, hang out with him for the day. And his, I'd, he would get up a little bit later than I did, so his mom would be making him breakfast. Breakfast for this guy was three eggs over easy, four sausage links, a stack of pancakes, you know, um, some French toast, two mugs of coffee, some bacon, things of that sort. That's, and that's what he had every day for breakfast. And when he went in the military, it was the same damn deal, okay? And today, it's the same damn deal. And you look at this guy, what do you think he looks like? Like he's ate that every day for breakfast. <laughs> like he's been eating like that every day for breakfast. He's huge. He's massive. He's big. I mean, he is big. His gut, he hasn't seen his penis in 70 years, 60 years, okay? He can't find it. It's down there somewhere. There's no way he could ever see it, okay? He's just that big. So that's the environmental component, okay? 
part of it is genetics, but part of it is the environment. How active you are, how much you eat, what you eat, what kind of radiation you expose yourself to, right? What you do mentally, what you read, what you learn, what kind of job you have. Oftentimes you can look at a person, you can look at a guy in particular, and you know exactly what kind of work they did for their livelihood. When I was a kid, I worked in steel mills and machine shops. And I would look around at these guys, and there'd be these 40-year-old guys, and they had, the last 20 years, they'd been working in the steel mill. And you look at these guys, and they were just beat to hell. They just looked rough. They were in bad damn shape. There weren't very many guys older than 45. Because by the time you were 45, having worked in a steel mill your whole life, you were dead. They just didn't make it. We, it's what you do influences what you look like. So that's the, the environmental component of that. Okay? So you as an organism are presenting this phenotype. Natural selection is operating on the phenotype, but only part of that phenotype is there as a result of genetics. Some of it is there as a result of environment. Okay? All right. So it's a consequence of genetic variation, environmental variation, and then obviously errors. So we talk about evolution as being a change in allele frequencies over time. All right? The sum of all genes in a population is referred to as the gene pool. And when we look at a gene pool, we characterize that gene pool by measuring allele frequencies. Not genotype frequencies, but allele frequencies. So what we care about is the allelic frequency, not the genotype frequency. Evolution is defined as changes in allele frequencies over time not changes in genotype frequency over time. So as an example, let's talk about pea plants. These are the things that um, Mendel used, right? Gregor Mendel. So there are red flowers and there are white flowers. Flower color is controlled by a single gene with two alleles. Big R is dominant and little r is recessive. We have complete dominance, so big R, big R, so the homozygous dominant will produce a red flower, and the heterozygote will produce a red flower. The homozygous recessive is going to produce a white flower. Question. I'm thinking genetics right now. Yeah. Like, on the first day, our professor told us that there's no such thing as a dominant or recessive gene. Yeah, it's, it's, mean? it's a terminology thing. Oh, okay. So he's, he's new school. And I'm old school. I'm old school. I still use it. Yeah, yeah no, it's, it's, it's a, it's, I mean, they, today you have a much better understanding of what's going on, right? So we're not operating at that level in this course. So. What he's telling you is correct, but the fundamentals are going to be the same. I, I figured the same thing. I just wanted to make sure. Yeah. This with Ruggiero? Ruggiero, yeah. Yeah. Is it Ruggiero or is it Ruggiero? I'm pretty sure it's Ruggiero. You're pretty sure it's what? Ruggiero. I'm going to call him Ruggiero. Okay. I don't care what he says. <laughs> okay, so for, for our purposes then, um, big R, big R is homozygous dominant, heterozygote, homozygous recessive. So let's imagine you have 100 individuals in a population. That then means you have 200 flower color alleles. You have many more, right? Because every organism has more than one cell. All right? So what we're talking about here is unique alleles, or if we were just looking at one cell from each individual. You obviously, I can't see, what, what color are your eyes? Hazel. Hazel? Yeah, these hazel colored eyes, you have like 
a gazillion quadrillion, you know, whatever it is, number of cells in your body, and each and every one of them has alleles for those eyes. Okay, so you don't have just one, you have many copies, but we're just going to think of the one copy. So, for our purposes, we now have 200 of those alleles. The number of those alleles that are big R is the allele frequency of big R, and the number that one minus that number is going to be what's little r. Okay? So it's a probability distribution. You are, you are either a big R or you're a little r. If 0.7 of the alleles are big R, 1 minus 0.7 is 0.3. That's the little r. Okay? So 0.3 plus 0.7 is equal to 1. All right, if you notice that from one generation to the next, the frequency of big R changes from 0.2 to 0.3, then you know that evolution has occurred. So we're talking about changes in allele frequencies over time. Okay? So let's use an example. Imagine we've got 30 big R, big R individuals, 20 big R, little r individuals, and 50 little r, little r individuals. Let's write this down. So big R, big R, big R, little r, and little r, little r. And we have 30 of these, and 20 of these, and 50 of these. Okay. So if P is equal to the frequency of R, then 1 minus P is going to be the frequency of little r. So we're going to call that Q. So P is equal to um, 1 minus Q. Or alternatively, what we could say is P plus Q equals 1. So the frequency of big R plus the frequency of little r has got to be equal to 1. All right. So for our example, P is going to be equal to, where we have 30 individuals like that, but each individual has two R's. All right? So 2 times 30 is 60. Here we have 20 individuals, and each individual has one big R and one little r. We only care about the big R's. So here we have 60 plus 20 makes 80. And now, how many total alleles do we have? Well, 60 plus 40 plus 100, that's 200. So we have 80 divided by 200 is equal to 0.4. So the frequency of the big R allele is 0.4. The frequency of the little r allele is 0.6. 0 0.6. 0 0.4 plus 0.6 is equal to 1. Alright, so to get Q, it's the same thing. 2 times 50 plus 20 divided by 200 is 0.6. So same thing. So P plus Q is equal to 1. Now, let's imagine that these P plants are going to mate panmictically. What does that mean? When we say that organisms mate panmictically, what do we mean? What is panmictic breeding? that breeds panmictically? Doesn't pan mean like all? Pan means all. Yeah. 
Well, actually, no. Um, well, yeah. I, so, so I guess there depends. Who is the god Pan? Why, why is the god Pan so intriguing? What does Pan do? Pan seduces all the nymphs. Okay. All right. So, don't give me your personal information. I don't want to know. It's none of my business. So, you know the correct answer, regardless of what the truth is. We don't care. Okay. So, uh, when you're walking around, you see some some person. You say, "Yeah, let's go, mate." Just any old body. Yeah, I'm, I'm ready. Let's do this thing. Or are you kind of a little more selective? Probably a little more selective, right? Just any old guy will do, or nah, not him, not him. A little more selective, right? Any old guy, or no? Okay. How many women in here would just? He wants to know. Any women in here just <laughs> sleep with any old guy? No. In other words, you're not breeding panmectically. You're selective about who you mate with. When you breed panmectically, it's just dump those alleles out there wherever, whenever, whoever, it makes no damn difference. Maple trees breed panmectically. Grass breeds panmectically. Apple trees breed panmectically. Most plants breed panmectically. They just dump their pollen out there. It goes where it may. It fertilizes whoever. That's called panmictic breeding. We don't do that. We turn out to be pretty damn selective about who we share our gametes with. Okay? All right. So let's imagine that these guys are going to breed panmectically. So what's the probability that a big R allele is going to combine with a big R allele? So here you've got, let's imagine these alleles are floating around in the air here. And what's the probability of big R, what did we say it was? Point four. Point four. that this big R allele is going to encounter another big R allele. Forty percent of the alleles floating around here are big R's. What's the probability that two big R's are going to find each other? No. Pardon? 0.16. So the probability of, here's one floating around, here's another one floating around. The probability that this one is big R is 0.4. The probability that this one is big R is 0.4. Crash together, 0.4 times 0.4 is 0.16. See that? Here it's floating along, 0.4. Here's a little r, 0.6. What's the probability that the little r encounters the big r? 0.4 times 0.6, so 0.24. But you could also have little r, big r. They get, so it could be big r, little r, or it could be little r, big r. Did I just say that exactly the same? It could, we could flip. There are two ways to get big r, little r. Big R, little r, little r, big r. Two ways to do it. So it's 0.4 times 0.6 plus 0.4 times 0.6. So 0.48. Now, little r is the probability of having a little r, 
Probability of having another little r, 0 0.6. Probability that they crash together, 0 0.6 times 0 0.6 is 0.36. See how that works? When events are independent of one another, we multiply the probabilities. Okay? So the probability of getting big R, big R, so the probability of big R is equal to little p. The probability of little r is equal to q. The probability of getting big R, big R is p squared. The probability of getting little r, little r is Q squared. The probability of getting big R, little r, is 2 times PQ. Because you could have big R times little r, or little r times big r. There are two ways to do it. So, P squared plus 2PQ plus R squared is equal to what? squared was equal to what? 5.16? Yep. Q squared was equal to what? 0.24. What was 2 times, what is P times Q? 0.4 times 0.6? Oh, I'm sorry, that's 0.36. P times Q is 0.24, 0.6 times 0.4 is 0.24 times 2 is 0.48. What is 0.16 plus 0.48 plus 0.36? 0.36. Think back to high school, junior high school algebra. Does that look vaguely familiar? Could you factor that? Could you simplify that expression? How could you simplify it? What would it be? You're going to factor that out. What would the factors be? squared plus 2pq plus q squared, right? So that then gives you what you expect to see in the next generation. Okay? He, does that look vaguely familiar? Does that look vaguely familiar? You guys ever do in high school or wherever Punnett squares? Or as they say here in Missouri, Punnett squares? I should stop bad mouthing in Missouri. I've lived here too long for bad mouthing. It used to be funny, now it's just sad. How, how do I make on a square. You draw a square first. I like that idea. How about I draw it like that? Doesn't work. And then big R, little R, 
big R, little r. So this then is big R, big R. This is big R, little r. This is little r, big R. That's little r, little r. So that's p squared, pq, pq, q squared. Okay. In other words, if I start off with a certain set of allele frequencies, forget about the genotype frequencies. If I start off with certain allele frequencies, I'm going to get, as long as I have 10 mctics reading and no selection, those are the allele frequencies that are going to be there forever. Okay? In order for those allele frequencies to change, something has to be operating on the system. Don't be confused by genotype frequencies. You can do a little experiment in Excel where you can set this up. Let's imagine you start off with certain genotype frequencies. Whatever you want. A thousand, a hundred of these and, you know, a thousand of those and 900 of these or something. And then you look at what happens over a couple of generations what happens with the genotype frequencies isn't the same as what happens with the allele frequencies. You have a certain genotype distribution and let them breed at random, the next generation, the genotype distribution will be different, but the allele frequency distribution will be the same. We care about allele frequencies, not genotype frequencies. So what has to happen in order for allele frequencies to change? Mutation. Yeah, one possibility is, is a mutation. Migration. Some kind of gene flow, so migration. So here you have a population, and there you have a population, and this has one set of allele frequencies. So this has P and Q, and this one has P prime and Q prime. You have individuals that are moving like that. Then you're introducing different allele frequencies into the population. So that will change it. Dying rate. Pardon? Dying rate. Maybe, maybe some allele, some genotypes are more prone to dying young than others. But if nothing happens, it's going to stay at that allele frequencies, at those allele frequencies forever and ever. So what are the possibilities? The assumptions are the only way we're going to get no changes in allele frequencies. First of all, we must have panmictic breeding. Okay? In order for there to be no change in the allele frequencies over time, we must have panmictic breeding. Next, we must have equal survival and reproduction of individuals. That is, we all have to have the same probability of surviving and the same probability of reproducing. The population must be closed. That is, no immigration and no emigration. So nobody's coming into the population and nobody is leaving the population. And then there can be no mutation. So let's start from the bottom and go up. How, how likely is mutation? How often do mutations occur? What's on the species? And how like the say We're we're talking about any mutation in, in any cell. I don't care about germ cells or somatic cells, just cells. How often, how often do mutations occur? A lot. Yeah, what, what's the number, roughly? I don't know. 
basically it's all it's roughly one in a million. So out of every one million cell divisions, you end up with a mutation. Most mutations are neutral. They make no difference. Okay, because they're in the exons rather than the they're in the introns rather than the exons. I forgot the whole terminology. Okay, so they're not in parts of the DNA molecule that are coding for anything. Alright? Some of the mutations are neutral, some are positive, and some are negative. Now, if the mutation happens in a somatic cell, nobody cares. Well, you care because maybe it results in cancer. The only mutations you really worry about are the ones that happen in your gonads, in your ovaries or your testes. Those are the ones that matter. Because when you have a mutation in your ovaries or your, te or your testes, that is transmitted to the next generation. So we know that every one million cell divisions, you get at least one mutation. So how many cell divisions do you have in your testes? You don't get any. But for you guys, how many cell divisions do you get in your testes on a daily basis? Lots. Every time you go to the bathroom, you're peeing out millions of little screaming sperm cells being wasted, going down the toilet into the Mississippi River, never to be used. Females, not so many, because you're starting off with roughly 100,000 oocytes, and you're using four of them, four, one oocyte roughly every four weeks. So you don't get nearly as many. Males are doing it all the time. Okay? In other words, the probability of having a mutation when you're making a baby is actually pretty damn high. Okay? So we know that we have mutations. So we're violating that fourth assumption of Hardy Weinberg equilibrium. Is our population closed? No. We've invited all, well, first of all, we're here in this country, we're sort of the visitors, we're the invaders. Well, the Native Americans, they were invaders too, but they got here, nobody else was here, right? So we invaded their country, and then to make our lives easier, we brought these African people over to work as slaves, okay? And then all the uh, Mexicans, the Chicanos are coming up, and then a bunch of people from Europe are coming over, and then People from Asia are coming over. I mean, everybody's in. It's sort of like a very open population. It's not closed. Okay? You can build all the damn walls you want. Okay? It's never exactly clear. Are those walls designed to keep the Chicanos out? Or is it designed to keep us in? It's never exactly clear. But if you build a wall, is it going to stop immigration? No. In San Diego, they swim around it. Okay. Um, in the in the Sonoran Desert, they tunnel under it. In some places, they just climb right over the top of it. Some places, they just walk around gaps in the wall because it's not complete. No. Or they'll, they'll go up to Canada on a fishing boat and then come down across the Canadian border. So no. Our population is not closed, it's open. How is about equal survival and reproduction? So, in your idealized world, how many bambinos do you want? Then you don't have to tell me the true answer, just talk, give me a number, whatever. Three? I don't want the real number, just how many do you want? One. One. Two. Two. Zero. Good for you. Yeah. Four. Four? <laughs> yeah. Two. It's all over the map. How many of you guys want as many as you can damn get? You don't care. Just what the hell. Not all of you are going to get that idealized number. Some of you are going to want four and end up with none. Some of you are going to want none and end up with 12. Okay? Just because... It happens, all right? We don't all have equal reproductive success. Some of us are going to make 12 babies and none of them live, okay? We don't all have equal reproductive success. 
We don't all have equal survival. Some of us die much too late. Some of us die much too early. We don't all have equal survival. So, so far, we violated that assumption. We violated that assumption. We violated that assumption. And the 60s are over. We're not breeding panmictically anymore. You're all pretty damn careful, the ladies at least, which are the only part of the population that matters. I'm sorry, guys, you don't. The only part of the population that matters, they don't breed at random. They turn out to be pretty darn selective about who they choose as a partner. Because it's an important decision for them. It's not important for you. It is important for them. OK? Right? We've already talked about that, have we not? Yeah, so it matters to you. It doesn't matter to you. So we don't read panmictically. In other words, we violate all four assumptions of party wide break equilibrium. What's the result? Evolution. Yeah, the default. Changes in allele frequencies over time is inevitable. There's no way to escape it. Okay. All right, so what sorts of things can change Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium? A bunch of stuff. All right, we've already talked about the different forms of selection, sexual selection, directional disruptive, okay, stabilizing selection. Any genetic drift? What is genetic drift? a small population of flying squirrels trapped on a mountaintop in Honduras. And they're totally isolated. And just by chance one year, the only squirrels that managed to reproduce were the ones with the big fat heads. So now there's this increase in number of squirrels in the next generation with big fat heads. Okay, That's called genetic drift. It's a sample size phenomenon. In small populations, when just by chance, some alleles are expressed more often, just by chance, did allele frequencies change in the population. Gene flow, okay? In other words, if you have, in the, in the human population, we've already talked about this, what are humans going to look like in 100,000 years? The number of blonde, blue-eyed people is going to be smaller. The number of people that are black-black is going to be smaller. The number of people that are brown is going to be much greater. OK? So our allele frequencies are changing. We have gene flow between the races. And because of that gene flow, we're going to converge on some kind of middle ground. All right. I think uh, there is a, a pretty clever way to do this. Uh, we're not going to go through that exercise. In the past, what I've done with students is I've had them set up an Excel spreadsheet. And then I've had them do the modeling where you assume panmictic breeding and just model you know, what the allele frequencies are going to be from one generation to the next. But you have in it, you build into it, a selection coefficient. So you choose one allele and you reduce the fitness of that one allele by a factor of s. So it's 1 minus s. When you do that, you can model how many generations it takes under a certain selective pressure for a particular allele to disappear. As an example, let's think about sickle cell anemia. So what is sickle cell anemia? Nobody in this class has it. How do I know that? 
because nobody in this class is African American. Okay? So, sickle cell anemia is when your red blood cells look like sickles instead of like donuts laying on their side. Okay? The problem with sickle cell anemia is that sickle cell blood cells can only carry half as much oxygen as donut-shaped blood cells. So they are anemic. If you are big S, big S, then all your blood cells look like this. If you are little s, little s, then all of your blood cells look like this. If you're big S, little s, then half your blood cells look like that and half look like that. So one would think that, that after all these years of selection against people with sickle cell anemia, that allele would disappear. Because if you look like this, if all your blood cells are like that, you are so anemic that you're unlikely to live long enough to reproduce. There's strong selection pressure against you. If you are heterozygous, you're not going to be running any races, you're not going to be playing any sports, you're going to be anemic. So let's imagine two people, big S, little s, fall in love and make babies. So you get big S, big S, there's a person with sickle cell anemia. Big S, little s, there's an anemic person. Big S, little s, an anemic person and a normal person. So 25% of their babies are going to be just fine, 50% of their babies are going to be anemic, and 25% of their babies are going to be dead. You would think that would put significant selection pressure against that allele. And yet, it persists. Why? Malaria. Pardon? Malaria. Malaria. It turns out if you look at a map of where sickle cell occurs on the planet, it occurs predominantly in areas with certain kinds of mosquitoes, in areas with malaria. It turns out that being the heterozygote protects you against malaria. In other words, there is selection pressure favoring the heterozygote. And for that reason, it persists. Okay? These, in a malaria world, don't do well. These survive just fine. Okay? So back in the 70s uh, in Los Angeles, uh, when sickle cell anemia was a hot topic and all that sort of stuff, um, there were all these efforts to help people with sickle cell anemia. So there were all these support groups and things of that sort on university campuses everywhere. I was at Cal State Fullerton, and they have a sickle cell anemia support group. And uh, all these people would show up to these support groups, and, and all these African Americans, you know, and they're hanging out with other African Americans, and African American men and African American women, and they're all there because they're all heterozygous for sickle cell anemia. And they fall in love, and they get married and they have babies and they've just propagated the sickle cell anemia, right? The alleles into the next generation. Because 50% of their babies are just like them, 25% are normal, and 25% are dead. Okay? So what they were doing by having those support groups was actually exacerbating the problem. Instead of saying, hey, you are a heterozygote, you would be better off marrying somebody that was a homozygous. Okay? But they didn't do that. So is that a bad thing? No, because it turns out that what, what's going to happen to malaria with climate change? Pardon? It'll spread. Yeah, like, like where? What parts of the U.S. are going to see resurgences of malaria? The south. The south. Okay. Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, Alabama. Mississippi, right, East Texas, all those places are going to be hotbeds for malaria, which will be kind of cool. All right, uh, so we're not going to go through that exercise. 
Uh, the point of that whole exercise is simply to demonstrate that given enough time, um, we're going to just skip all of that sort of stuff. Uh, given all that, given that selection pressure, even when the selection pressure is really severe, 